Okay, maybe maybe I can start. Okay, okay, we'll we'll just wait for So welcome everyone to the School of Astrophysics Weekly Colloquium. 
Uh, and it is, a, it is our great pleasure to have with us Professor Pijushpani Bhattacharji from Syracuse University. So Professor Bhattacharji has a very long and distinguished career. I will just mention very briefly. So he did his uh, undergraduate and master's. And actually, he grew up in Assam and he did his master's in physics from Delhi University and then moved to <clears throat> uh, the UK, the, the, to the United Kingdom and did his PhD from Imperial College, which some of you might know has a very, very, very strong theoretical cosmology program. And he was a postdoc at University of Chicago, had hold many visiting positions, many were and was, and then he came back to India and was a professor at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And then later he came to Kolkata and joined Shah Institute of Nuclear Physics and is now uh, an emeritus. So he's retired now and he is now a uh, visiting faculty at Syracuse University. And he has been a leading expert on dark matter in India and abroad. And he's going to tell us about this exciting uh, work on looking at supernova or, or observing supernova neutrinos with direct dark matter detection experiments. So without further delay, let me welcome Professor Bhattacharji on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Suchetana Chatterjee for inviting me to give this colloquium. Well, I've been in Kolkata for many years. Uh, actually, frankly, I have never, I have been to a presidency in various, but never uh, given a talk here. And of course, presidency uh, before. Mm, uh, in Calcutta University, I did, but never had an occasion. Was it? Oh, is that? Oh, then I could be. Yeah, long back, maybe. Okay, uh, probably. So anyway, it's always good to be back here and see uh, lots of students here. This is now a uh, great place, I guess, for and they have started the astrophysics school also, I understand. So looks good. So um, today uh, I want to talk about a topic that I got uh, interested uh, a few years ago, uh, partly motivated by the fact that the dark matter detectors that are being built to detect dark matter are not seeing the dark matter and have not been successful so far. So a lot of people are thinking about if these detectors can be used for any other purpose. Remember that in fact, some of the first detection of supernova neutrino that I'll soon talk about was also in a detector that was not quite initially meant for detecting supernova neutrinos. They were in fact meant for detecting uh, 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 proton decay uh, um, um, predicted by some of the grand unified theories at that time. Anyway, I'll come to that. Oh, it goes, okay. So, uh, Without further ado. Okay. So, very, uh, uh, this is the rough uh, arrangement of the talk. Uh, brief uh, review of core collapse uh, supernova, and with a special uh, emphasis on this particular supernova that was seen in 1987. I'll talk about this. Then, detection of neutrinos from supernova 1987A. Uh, then uh, all this will not be in detail, just uh, touching up on the, give you the brief introduction. Supernova neutrino detection methods, and then supernova neutrino detection in liquid xenon-based dark matter detectors, and uh, summary. <clears throat> Before I proceed, and many people here are familiar, they're astrophysics students, but still everybody may not miss a colloquium. 
So I just remind you of some of the basic distance scales used in astronomy. An astronomical unit, okay, is kind of average uh, arc sun uh, distance. It's about eight light minutes. Okay. Okay. Another distance scale uses per sec, which is the angle, uh, which is the distance at which the average sun arc distance uh, subtends an angle of one arc second. So in terms of actual distance, it's about three times 10 to the power 18 centimeter. In these units, often these are used in astronomy, one kilometer per second speed corresponds to about millionth of a parsec per year. Uh, mass is usually measured in solar masses. One solar mass is about two times 10 to the 33 grams. Uh, density is uh, typical uh, in particle physics for you know, or say interstellar matter has a density of about one uh, G with a one proton mass per centimeter cube, which corresponds to about one third of a solar mass per per sec cube. So these are some units. More importantly, as I'll come, so there is this astronomers use a very, I should say, very, very unusual system of measuring brightness uh, by the apparent magnitude. And this is the, it's a kind of logarithmic scale. Uh, so uh, this figure shows, so this shows that if for every five increment in this something called the, the apparent magnitude, the brightness reduces by a factor of 100. So uh, that is for every one increment in apparent magnitude, the brightness decreases by a factor of 2.5 roughly. So uh, uh, so this is for our kind of uh, limit of our uh, uh, naked eye limit uh, is the magnitude around six, okay? So this I'm showing here because as we'll see, the supernova 1987A was uh, optically uh, detected. Uh, well, the story starts about 168, Thousand years ago, when a star, which is the designation is Sanjulik, this whatever some coordinates, it's a blue supergiant star with a visible magnitude of about 10. So, in that scale, you can't see it in naked eye. Okay. Uh, brighter objects are on this side, and these are fainter objects, remember. So, uh, uh, so that star in it lies in large Magellanic cloud, which is at a distance of about 51 kiloparsec from Earth. It went bust, it exploded. And the light from that explosion has been traveling for 168,000 years, okay? And reached Earth on February 23rd, 1987. <clears throat> uh, 23rd and 24, depending on where you are. Uh, so I should keep an uh, maybe finger over there. Maybe a lady tie a show. No, it's on the okay from there. We dig, we dig, we dig. I can do it at Chole at Chicago. It at the Tatsuna. Okay. Okay. Pointing. Oh, it is. It is eight. 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 Uh, it exploded and light reached on 23rd and it was the closest recorded supernova since the invention of telescope and you could actually see it with naked eye. Uh, it became a magnitude of five after, and this was uh, way back in 1604 Kepler had seen a naked eye supernova. So this is the closest supernova uh, seen with naked eye and uh, so these, I just don't have to read the details. These are the IA circulars. Whoa. It will come? Okay. So uh, it uh, mentioned, it was discovered by this astronomer, young astronomer, Ian Shelton, the University of Toronto. He was working at this Las Campanas uh, uh, Observatory at Chile. 
uh, and this became a magnitude five object. And and there are some independent discoveries also by other people, but uh, they came, uh, I guess, later. But Jan Shelton is generally credited with uh, this discovery. So this is sort of before and after picture. So this is the field in large Magellanic cloud. They were just taking routine observations of the LMC, this field of view, uh, not expecting to see anything. And uh, when he developed the plates, suddenly he said, oh, what is this guy here doing? Extremely bright object. And then he actually went out of the, his uh, night telescope room and looked uh, at the sky you know, to verify this. Okay, And there it was. He could actually see with the naked eye, a very bright star. So this star became this after the explosion. And this is a historic uh, event. Uh, uh, for many reasons. First, as I said, is the first naked eye supernova observations. Soon after that observations, immediately uh, there were some already neutrino detectors uh, around the world, uh, meant uh, designed for other purposes. But as soon as this became public, this news that uh, supernova has happened, and many of the theories of supernova were known to predict neutrino emission, actually, which precedes before the light uh, uh, emission. And so there were lots of telephone calls here and there. And uh, so on February 8, 28th itself, so the observation was on February 23rd, 24th, because they had to go back to their detectors, okay, and check. And this collaboration called Mont Blanc Neutrino uh, Observatory, okay, it's a Soviet and uh, I think Italian also people are there. Uh, collaboration reported immediately that they have seen some uh, neutrino events. We shall come to this uh, observation later because it's now uh, debated whether this neutrino that they saw was really associated with supernova 87 or not. But soon after, this is February 28, on March 10, Koshiba, as I'll show in the next slide, uh, Masatisho, uh, Masatoshi Koshiba, he is the sort of father of this uh, Tamiokande detector in Japan, often called the father of neutrino astronomy, really, because he uh, detected the solar neutrino and verified that it's coming from sun because he had directional measurement in it. And uh, so Koshiba, uh, see, a lot long days passed between these two, 10 days, uh, because they were verifying and cross-verifying their detection. And then they reported uh, about two to three hours prior to the optical detection, 11 events, neutrino events, actually anti-neutrino, as uh, new E bars, uh, from 87, supernova 87A. It is a water Cherenkov detector, which I'll uh, mention in slightly more detail later, with all these energy attributes. And so there are 11 events detected. And on March 11, there's a, another detector, Irvine, uh, Michigan, Brookhaven, IMB collaboration, okay? Uh, also reported, uh, they I think got eight events, in time coincidence with the Kamiokande detector. So uh, these neutrinos were detected about two to three hours before the optical detection, because neutrinos, which is in perfect agreement with the theory which predict that neutrinos come out first because they are not hindered by many things. Light comes later. Time consistency between Kamiokande and the IMB, but time inconsistency of both these with this Mont Blanc, and even now it's debated what they actually saw. So it is now regarded as they must be seeing something else or whatever. So here is uh, Koshiba. Uh, I show this because he passed away just about two years ago and he received Nobel Prize in 2002 uh, with um, um, uh, Ray Davis for detecting solar neutrino. Uh, uh, I uh, was fortunate to have some personal association with uh, Professor Koshiba. I had met him when in a meeting in Japan, 
around 1990. I was in Chicago at that time. Uh, and he was already very famous after the neutrino detection. More interestingly, he was visiting Chicago uh, in David Schramm's group, where I was a, a, a postdoc. And uh, so I saw him, but being a big man, they always kept a little distance from him. But interestingly, uh, one uh, fine morning, uh, David Schramm's secretary, Robert Bernstein, comes into my room and gives me a big packet, okay, thick, big, big packet, this thick. And uh, she says, Rijush, uh, Dave has asked me to give this to you. Um, uh, you will realize what it is, and I'm sure you will enjoy whatever Dave has asked you to do. So I soon open the envelope, and there's a letter with a um, uh, heading of physics reports, of which David Fram was the editor at that time. And the letter saying that, um, uh, so and so, dear so and so, I would like you to review this manuscript for uh, physics reports. So I initially, I didn't know, I often received this and that manuscript. I look at the author's page, and it's actually written by Masatisha Koshiba. And I was sort of stunned. So this man, so it comes to me, and then Robert further tells me that Dave has personally asked me to tell you that don't be uh, overwhelmed by this uh, name, be ruthless on the manuscript as you would with any manuscript and make uh, corrections because he's, uh, he's being, being from Japan, his English is not always that good. So he says, whatever you don't understand, don't accept it, right? The way it should be understood and be ruthless. That's what he said. Make corrections as you feel. And so, but more than that, I opened the, as I went through the pages, it's a veritable gold mine. I mean, the way he has written, he gives blow by blow account of uh, this discovery of the supernova 1987A, how neutrino detectors work. And in fact, I have. So this one, but interestingly, so after I made, uh, in, in due course, I submitted it back with my comments and corrections. And uh, more than uh, going through this, I actually learned, the first time I actually learned this neutrino, uh, supernova neutrino and how they are detected from this. But after I came back to India in 1992, suddenly a big envelope uh, arrives at my desk and it's from Elsevier. Uh, North Holland at that time, physics report, with a copy of this. And so I look at it, at the end of this, in the acknowledgement section, it says the note added, and it says, my sincere thanks go to Dr. P. Bhattacharya, who kindly read the manuscript very carefully and gave the necessary corrections together with the appropriate advice. I was just, you know, out of, <laughs> you know, here is Masami Koshiba, and he was so uh, kind enough and uh, humble to add these lines because David Shram must have told him, uh, told him that all these made by him. <laughs> this is a physics reports review article on, so it's called Observational Neutrino Astrophysics. This is the first kind of review article written by a father of the neutrino astronomy field and gives very details. So I was very, very happy and always keep it whenever I want to uh, 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 turn to, you know, um, refer to something about supernova neutrino, I go back to this. Some of you might like to read it also. It might be there in your library. You can get the reference. So here is a summary of uh, uh, neutrino burst of supernova 1987. So this is the Kamiokande 11 events. This is the IMB, uh, some eight events. And this is the another Soviet detector of Vaxan, okay? Uh, they also detected in coincidence with this. So with within clock uncertainty signals are contemporaneous. Okay, I took it from Georg Ruffel's uh, uh, report. Uh, so these detectors were designed primarily for detecting baryon number violating nucleon decays predicted in grand unified theories. But here they became very useful in supernova detection. So similarly, as we'll see, some dark matter detectors designed for dark matter may be useful for supernova. I would like to mention again from this uh, a very interesting fact, there's a serendipity because, so this is from uh, Koshiba's report. 
so this is uh, the uh, signal strength, number of hits in their photo tubes, and this is the time. So as you see, uh, so these are so here is the event signal event, sudden burst of number increase in the number of events. And this signal occurred just two minutes after the gain checking dead time of 105 seconds duration. So during this period, no observations are made. It's a, it's a gain checking dead time. Had the supernova happened just two minutes earlier, you would have missed it in neutrinos. The second fact is more interesting. Uh, this was detected on a Monday and it was a substitute holiday in that uh, lab. Substitute holiday in the sense that they probably a Saturday or Sunday was a working day for some other reason. So in substitute, a Monday was a substitute holiday. And this experiment was running on a holiday trigger mode. That is not many people there. It just runs on its own. No. Had it been a working Monday, the physicist on shift would have started changing the data tapes at around 4.30 p.m. local time. Okay, and super and would have completely missed the signal at 4:35 p.m. because the data would be changed, experiment would be stopped, and so again, serendipity, really, very, very lucky that. Maybe some dark matter even happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes, during that time, it's such a so here we are. Uh, luck favors the uh, uh, yes. <laughs> So uh, now that it was confirmed, the implications of the many things, hundreds of um, close to thousand papers were written. Uh, so the most important was that it confirmed the general theoretical understanding of the core collapse supernova explosion mechanism. It uh, enabled derivation of important constraints on neutrino properties, such as the magnetic dipole moment, possible electric charge, their lifetime, neutrinos could be unstable, test of relativity, equivalence. I won't go into the details, but it, lots of things were done, uh, papers were written just from this neutrino observation. Here is a very brief, I don't mean to go into the stellar evolution theory here, just a uh, very brief, uh, some of you probably study in your astrophysics uh, courses. There are two main ways uh, stars end their life, okay? One it goes to so-called white dwarf stain, and another is type two supernova uh, explosion. Uh, so uh, it evolves when the fuel ends, the, uh, uh, the radiation pressure that provides the support against gravitational collapse is withdrawn. As a result, uh, the, uh, all kinds of things happen. Uh, one route is uh, the nuclear fuel, it burns up to some uh, helium and maybe up to uh, carbon. And then uh, uh, it becomes a planetary nebula, it expels, it becomes a red giant. Okay, our sun is probably will do that and uh, expel out and becomes a planetary nebula, leaving behind what is called a white dwarf with Chandrasekhar mass uh, uh, objects. And another stage is very large stars, more than about 10 solar, eight solar mass maybe, okay? They end up their lives as uh, neutron stars. So I give some more details of uh, this uh, uh, di discussion in words about this. So stellar death, a very brief summary. If you have low mass stars, they end up as white dwarf. What happens is a hydrogen burning, nuclear fusion in the core, which we know generates the power uh, that uh, the uh, due to which the stars shine, our sun shines by burning hydrogen to helium by nuclear fusion, generates energy. Okay, radiation pressure provides support against gravitational collapse. But as the fuel depletes, okay, the burning slows down. It provides less radiation pressure. The core contracts under gravity. Okay, the core temperature rises. Then remaining hydrogen burns to helium even faster. High radiation pressure pushes the outer material outward and the star eventually becomes a red giant. The core contracts as helium is exhausted. Helium burning starts because the temperature rise now. Helium uh, can fuse into carbon and eventually in some cases to oxygen inside the core of the star. Okay, but then for low mass stars, that's where it stops. Nuclear burning stops because it's not massive enough and the core is not uh, enough supply of nuclear fuel. So uh, the last burst of energy from the core expels the outer material. It becomes a planetary nebula, eventually leaving behind a white dwarf of Chandrasekhar mass. But more importantly, the subject of our discussion here, in larger stars, this it does not uh, stop at uh, carbon because the core continues to uh, collapse. 
and uh, the core uh, carbon core now contracts temperature rises then carbon burns to oxygen oxygen to silica, uh, silicon silicon to iron and that's finally where it stops because iron has the largest highest binding energy of uh, amongst all the nuclei uh, if you want to go beyond this it's no more fusion reaction okay it actually takes away energy whereas on this side energy is supplied by the uh, reaction so it stops there so for example for a 25 solar mass stars these are the lifetime lifetimes of various burning stages and the last stages happens in a very fast actually quickly so what happens is now the iron has the highest binding energy no more fusion energy iron core starts collapsing and then a series of events happens as the iron core collapses temperature rises again high energy gamma rays are emitted Okay, if uh, iron nuclei are then photo disintegrated back into helium nuclei, okay, and iron core collapse continues beyond electron degeneracy, okay, because electrons are fermions, they can provide, uh, there is an effective repulsion if you try to push them too much, okay, so that's uh, due to Pauli's exclusion principle. So what happens now is the protons, free protons start capturing the electrons and the material becomes more and more neutron rich and neutrinos are emitted. And in fact, at this stage, a burst of neutrinos are emitted. These are called neutronization uh, neutrinos, okay? And so this is the largest flux of neutrinos that comes from a neutrino uh, supernova emission at the very neutronization stage, okay? So this is a veritable gravity-powered neutrino bomb, actually. So the, car cool, uh, the core cools and contracts even further. And so neutron-rich material achieves and then exceeds the nuclear density. At that point, the repulsive nuclear forces come into play. You can't push the uh, core uh, very much because it's very uh, uh, nuclear density now. So the inner core rebounds and it creates a shock. Creates a shock which propagates outward and reverses the infalling motion of the outer core material into the inner core, okay? and a substantial fraction of these neutrinos, a fraction of these neutrino emitted are also temporarily trapped because neutrinos are weak interaction, they freely travel, but this density is so high, nuclear density, that even super uh, neutrinos also interact and temporarily uh, are trapped inside, and then they deposit their energy into the behind of the shock front, and this that revitalizes the shocks, which finally uh, go outward and will expel the material, as we shall see. In the meantime, the core temperature rises so high and density so high that a new wave of nucleosynthesis starts again. We can remember this iron nuclei have been photo disintegrated to, to helium and a new nucleosynthesis starts all over again. And this time it produces an elements well beyond iron, okay? The star actually couldn't do this during its lifetime, but this during the collapse phase, uh, all the heavy elements are produced inside uh, uh, the uh, star. Eventually, the shock reaches outer material, expels the stellar material, and goes into the interstellar medium, out of which new stars are formed, and uh, these heavy elements, okay, we are formed, the heavy elements within our body are actually those formed inside this uh, supernovae. So, depending on the mass of the remaining core, and the new star, new core, uh, neutron-rich core, it's almost uh, entirely made up of neutrons, Okay, is supported by the degeneracy pressure of the neutrons now, which are fermions and exclusion principle comes into play. So they provide the support against gravitational collapse and it becomes a neutron star. But the, if the final mass of the remaining core is somewhat larger, okay, uh, above several times, uh, uh, maybe a few times uh, solar mass, uh, it actually depends on the nuclear equation of state, it ends up as a black hole. So this is the neutrino flux, some idea about, so you see, this is the neutronization neutrino burst flux from the neutrino in these units. So about 10 to the power 53, few times 10 to the power 53 ergs per second is the luminosity. So uh, it's emitted over a period of about 10 seconds, okay? So the total energy emitted is huge, 10 to the power, close to 10 to the power, few times 10 to the power uh, uh, 54 almost. And 
So there are uh, neutronization bursts and next comes what is called accretion phase and then comes the cooling phase. Again, these are details, but the flux of the neutrino, I had to multiply by a factor of 10 to show it on the same scale. So this is 10 times down, this is 100 times down. So it gradually cools down and the neutrino emission fades over a period of time. And these neutrinos of all the flavors are emitted. Neutrino, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino, these are called new, new X by... Uh... Right. So average energy is some 15 MeV, 10 MeV neutrinos are emitted from uh, supernova. So this is a kind of energy range, fortunate energy range that we'll see will be useful for dark matter detector also. So about tens of MeV average energy, but the spectrum goes all the way up to 20, 30 MeV. Okay, the full neutrino uh, spectrum. And these are from a particular simulation of uh, neutrino. So how do you detect these neutrinos? Well, the neutrinos are very weakly interacting. They just pass by the entire earth without interacting often. But still, if you make sufficiently large detector, large amount of detector material, you can uh, detect them mainly through these two ch uh, channels. These are weak inter. It can have charged current reactions. That is, a neutrino can interact with an electron. Okay, becomes an electron, and then electron becomes a neutrino. So there is a charge exchange in this process. Uh, the same process can also go through uh, neutral current. Also, neutrino remains a neutrino. Electron remains an electron, but the scatter. There is a certain amount of energy transfer from this neutrino to the electron. Okay, and you detect that electron. So in water Cherenkov detectors. This electron, the energy transferred to the electron is large enough that this electron is moving with speeds which is larger than the speed of light in water. So it emits a radiation called Cherenkov radiation. It, it is emitted in a cone pattern. It's narrow, narrow cones are emitted. So you detect the Cherenkov cone. It's useful because you can work out the direction from which that electron came and from which you can work out the direction from which the neutrino came. So that's how you, in fact, verified that the solar neutrinos were coming from the direction of sun. That's what Koshiba did and got Nobel Prize. Um, uh, but these neutrinos that were actually detected in Kamiokande use this. This is a larger cross-section process. Okay, uh, it's an inverse beta decay. So anti-neutrino interacts with proton in your water, hydrogen, okay, becomes a positron and changes to a, a neutrino. And the, you detect this positron, it annihilates with the electron in the background, gives two gamma rays. You can detect those gamma rays. Neutrons can also be tagged. You can detect uh, with the various mechanisms. So this was, this is the one. So this is uh, Kamiokande, detected mainly antineutrinos, okay? Most of them are antineutrinos, okay? Then there are other channels, another way the neutrinos can interact with the entire nucleus, okay? Through charged current and neutral current process, okay? So uh, this neutrino comes in the entire nucleus, it interacts, okay? It will finally emit an electron and this nucleus gets excited to a higher excitation state. It can emit D excites by emitting gammas and neutrons, you can detect these two also. Uh, and detect these also, depending on your detector. But a most interesting channel that will be useful for my last part of the talk, okay, is called coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Here, very interesting uh, thing happens. A single neutrino, which is essentially massless, okay, if it has the right energy, it interacts with the entire nucleus. It's If its energy is not too large, then it's wavelength, de Broglie wavelength is larger than the size of the nucleus. So it sees the whole nucleus as a whole, does not penetrate inside the nucleus. So it scatters from the entire nucleus as a whole. As a result, the, new, uh, the whole nucleus gets a kick. So just imagine neutrino is a massless object and nucleus is some hundreds of nucleons, some hundred GB object. It is able to actually move it, okay? Physically it gives it a recoil. And if you can detect this recoil in very low recoil amount, then you have a means of detecting these neutrinos. Important thing about that, that is that this is a neutral current process. That is, it is equally sensitive to all the flavors of neutrinos. So if the supernova is emitting neutrinos of electron type, muon type, tau type, 
all of them will equally well give this uh, uh, scattering, okay? Not so for this, this is sensitive only to. So no single detector now, anyway, I'll come to this. So this, remember, we'll use this uh, for our next, uh, yeah. Are not massless. Yes, small, it is relativistic. Yeah. 10 MeV energy, the mass is supposed to be, even if it is a few EV, electron volt, so it's a million times. Hardly any, because this this is it's a million times, million times, so it's relativistic. So, uh, the reason, another reason for this is because it's a coherent process, the cross section for this is largely enhanced as I used to, by roughly the square of the number of nucleons inside this nucleus. I'll come to that in more detail. So again, uh, without going into too much details, here are all the neutrino cross sections that you, you need to know the cross section. So these are give you an idea. These are like 10 to the power minus 38 centimeters square, very, very small cross section. You compare this with the most well-known cross section in physics, uh, in electromagnetic is the Thomson cross section. Thomson cross section is like six times 10 to the minus 25 centimeter square. This is 10 to the minus 38 centimeter square. So many orders of magnitude down. But still, you can detect neutrinos with this kind of cross sections. These are various detectors that uh, I'll skip some of the slides. Okay. So, supernova, they emit neutrinos of all flavors. Okay. Different detectors use different neutrino interaction channels for their detection. Currently, no single neutrino detector is able to detect all flavors of neutrinos in the same detector. That would be something very useful to do because of the reasons that I'll come to. Important to detect all the neutrino flavors because this can give a good estimate of the total energy emitted by the supernova neutrino. Remember, neutrinos take almost 99% of the energy emitted in a supernova and optical light is only one person, okay? So it's very, if you want to derive energetics of the supernova, it's very important to get the neutrino of all flavors. And coherent neutrino nucleus interaction, as I just mentioned, is one interaction that is sensitive to all flavors simultaneously, okay? So normal detectors can't do it, but the dark matter detectors will be able to detect these neutrino of all flavors, which I'll discuss. So before that, to go into dark matter detectors, a very quick summary of the dark matter, uh, not uh, uh, most people are familiar with. So this is the visible universe, okay? Uh, how do you know there's dark matter? Well, uh, the point is that what we see in the visible universe, stars and galaxies, may not be the entire material that is there in the universe. And it comes uh, with the name called mass discrepancy. There is a mass discrepancy. That is, you, the mass that you derive, which is gravitating mass from dynamical considerations, like studying the orbits of object around another object, those are dynamical masses. Those are found to be always significantly larger than the total visible matter masses in this system, because you know roughly how many stars are there, estimate, make estimates of gas and stars. You can uh, make an estimate of visible matter, but the gravitational mass is always significantly larger than the visible mass that you see. And this has uh, been a long history back from the 70s and 80s. What is, it goes by the name of mass versus light ratio in the universe increases as we go to larger and larger length scales in the universe. So there is basically more mass than light in the universe, okay? for uh, a given standard of mass to light ratio. So it increases and eventually uh, saturates. So the universe is more and more dark on larger and larger scales because there's more mass than light. So there is, it's called, uh, so a resolution of this problem uh, has two possibilities, okay? Either there must be a lot of invisible mass in the universe. This is the well-known dark matter hypothesis that we don't see, that do not emit any electromagnetic radiation or we must modify the Newtonian dynamics based on which we calculate the gravitational mass, okay? So, uh, so both sides, uh, initially there was not much work. Now a lot of people are actually working on this possibility also, but dark matter is the other hypothesis. 
Uh, dark matter is needed also from cosmological considerations, from structure formation, because in order to form the galaxies and clusters of galaxies and all that we see in the universe today, okay, you need dark matter. The reason for this is that if you had only visible matter, visible, uh, apparent, uh, uh, presumably all the structures that we see in the universe today grew out of some very small density fluctuations created in the early universe by some process like inflation or whatever it is. So you had some small fluctuations of density and gravitation being always attractive. If you create a over density, it attracts more matter. It becomes more and more over dense and the things grow. So that is generally the property of any mass. So you have to make that initial seed fluctuations so even if you create, but the visible, the atomic, normal atomic matter has a problem because in the early universe, if anything you created uh, the fluctuation, they cannot grow because uh, the moment they try to cluster, because photons are very coupled to electrons and uh, protons, there's a, they try to exert kind of radiation pressure and try to disperse. The, so gravitation tries to collapse, whereas the photons these are coupled to the photons that try to disperse it. As a result, oscillations are set. Okay, you don't, they don't grow, but they keep oscillating. They try to grow and they can start growing only after neutral atoms start forming in the universe is cooled down sufficiently so that below a few electron volt uh, when hydrogen uh, becomes uh, neutral and then they start growing. But then if you make the calculations, it's too late. These fluctuations, then cannot grow to an extent to explain the fluctuation that we see in the present day universe. But the dark matter helps because dark matter are immune to any interaction with photons and anything. If in the early universe you had a lot of dark matter and if you had a density fluctuation, there would be fluctuation in the dark matter also. The dark matter fluctuation will keep growing because photons don't interact with them. They become bigger and bigger clumps, okay? And, but we do need that our galaxies are made up of visible matter also. So when visible matters can grow, they already see these large clumps of dark matter which have grown you know, during this period has grown to this height, whereas these guys are just oscillating here. So they see this large gravitational potential provided by the dark matters, I'll skip this. And they fall into, the, the visible matter falls into the large clumps of dark matter into the gravitational well that are already there. So the dark matter helps in forming clumps of baryonic visible matter. So that's how this is visible matter embedded in dark matter. So, so the picture that we have is that our galaxy visible matter is a tiny little thing embedded probably in a large cloud of dark matter, okay, extending to very large uh, distances. And it has advantages because if you now uh, do uh, mass modeling, okay, with proper modeling, it can explain one of the mysteries that we have seen earlier, that uh, rotation curve of the galaxies did not fall as expected of if material was only visible matter. You should have seen the rotation curve, that is the stars and gas actually rotate around our galaxy. So this is Milky Way, okay, it nicely explains if you take a dark matter component and add the two, then you can pass through the uh, uh, data. So this solves. Again, there are lots of details. I'm uh, uh, avoiding this, this being a colloquium. There are other evidences from gravitational lensing, primordial nucleosynthesis, and all this. Thing. Again, I'll skip here. I'll only say that one of the most favorable candidates for this dark matter is something called weakly interacting massive particles, very massive particles called WIMPs. Okay. And these WIMPs can be detected in principle by these dark matter detectors. Basically, idea is that a WIMP, uh, for example, in this case, it's uh, something called neutral, you know, forget uh, the name. Uh, so it comes and interacts with a nucleus in your detector, gives it a kick, just like, as I said, the coherent neutrino would do. But in this case, it's a non-relativistically moving uh, massive object, okay? Of mass, maybe a few times proton mass, few GeV. It gives a recoil and you can estimate how many events you expect, a few events per kilogram of the detector material per year, okay? And recoil energy of this nucleus is typically a few uh, keV, okay? So nuclear physics experiment can pick up in principle this kind of small uh, recoil energies, okay? 
And so this dark matter detection uh, happens by various techniques. So here you have a new neutralino or dark matter particle came, gave it a nuclear recoil, okay? And this recoiling nucleus deposits its energy inside your detector medium, which manifests in one of these forms. Either it produces light or it produces uh, electric charge, okay? It ionizes or it produces just heat, heats up the material, uh, cryogenically cooled uh, uh, detector. So various detectors, all these detectors are operating, employing one or more of these techniques. Usually both two, at least two techniques are utilized in the same detector in order to uh, distinguish between uh, dark matter and other background particles. So I'll, these are called liquid xenon, uh, is a very good medium for detection of dark matter. I'll come to that. So this is how it works. If you have a charge, so the dark matter particle comes, or maybe neutrino comes, coherently interacts, and produces a, a recoiling nucleus, which deposits its energy in this xenon. It will do. It immediately deposits its energy, and it's a scintillating material. That is, the liquid is scintillates. It produces light whenever there is a charged particle which hits uh, the medium. So it produces a prompt scintillation light here and also produces lots of ionization electrons, which are drifted upwards by an applied electric field towards a gas phase. So this is a liquid phase, there's a gas phase, and there are PMTs here and there. So as they pass through, these electrons are uh, magnified by this uh, uh, high voltage uh, uh, electric current, okay? And they do again emit scintillation light in this gas phase, it's called S2. And these two are observed, simultaneously by these detectors. And from these, you can actually localize the event location and the strength of these two signals can tell you what kind of particle, how much energy was deposited, all these things. So this is how uh, it works. Interesting thing is that there's a delay between because the charges have to be drifted upwards and this drift time delay and the strength of these two lines, the photon, these are scintillation light, okay, bluish light. Uh, picked up by phototubes, and they can be used for detecting, uh, for telling what kind of particle actually hit your detector. So these are very, uh, some of the detectors are already operating, uh, this Panda in China, this is in uh, Gran Sasso in Italy, this is the coming up LZ detector, the, these are all liquid xenon, and this is the next generation huge detector called Darwin, it will have 40 tons of liquid xenon. And uh, those will be, so this is again, they have increased the sensitivity of these detectors to such a high level that it's amazing they haven't yet detected the dark matter, but instead they are starting becoming sensitive to neutrinos, which is a problem for this kind of detectors. This is called neutrino flow. Again, I'll skip this. So neutrinos in dark matter detectors. So neutrinos can trigger these dark matter detectors also through coherent interaction. So brief idea about this coherent, as I already mentioned, neutrino comes, whole nucleus gives it a recoil. It's a neutral current process. It's a weak energy, it goes through exchange of uh, uh, Z boson. Okay, so neutron, neutrino plus nucleus goes to neutrino plus nucleus. You can work out the cross section. It's a standard model process, but nobody had seen it until about five years ago, okay, in laboratory, okay. So importantly, this cross-section is proportional to n square, n being the number of neutrons inside the nucleus. So larger the nucleus, detector nucleus, better, higher is the cross-section, more will be the rate. But then there is a problem because the recoil, if it is more and more heavy, it will be less and less recoil energy. So, uh, so there is a trade-off. So if the mass is high, recoil energy is small, but the cross-section is large. So you have to judiciously choose the material so such that enough number of events are created. Ha, Z is the number of protons. Protons. Yeah, this is the Weinberg angle, uh, weak or weak angle, sine squared theta. So the reason it's proportional to N squared is that because this is roughly a quarter, sine squared theta, so quarter cancels one minus Okay, so this term disappears, so it's become n, and since it's q square, it's n square. Yeah, gf is the Fermi, weak, weak interaction Fermi coupling constant. Okay, m is the mass of the nucleus. Why just that? Uh -oh. ah. 
So M is the mass of the nucleus. Uh, and this, so, uh, and this is something called form factor. This is the coherence factor because higher the energy of the neutrino, less will be the coherence because the de Broglie wavelength will shrink. Okay, it will start penetrating inside the nucleus, not see the whole nucleus, it will not be proportional to n square. So this is the loss of coherence because of this. So yeah, the weak angle, sine square, sine square. That's, that's the parameter of the standard model. Yeah, is a measured quantity, okay? This is one of the free parameters in the standard model. So uh, lots of experiments are dedicated to determining sine squared theta w, okay? Uh, so, uh, and again, so this is the form factor and they have various forms. Some technical details are there in a paper that I'll mention. So you can, uh, I can skip this because I want to concentrate mainly on the physics. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is a this uh, uh, was predicted. This coherent neutrino interaction, uh, where is that? Huh? Was predicted way back in seventies. Okay, from Friedman, Friedman, and these all these people, and their importance in supernova neutrinos also. But it couldn't be detected. The reason is that such low recoil you can't detect in. Uh, and don't have enough high flux of neutrinos, okay? So only five years ago, in 2017, a laboratory detection of this coherent electron, it was made because they could now have a very strong neutrino beam made in laboratory, okay? Which was fired at a cesium iodide detector and uh, they could actually see this uh, process and uh, it was detected. So here is the cross section for this very large cross-section compared to other uh, uh, weak interaction cross-sections that are employed in uh, neutrino detections. So now that we have such a detector and it can coherently, neutrinos can, uh, dark matter can coherently uh, uh, interact, so can neutrinos, as I said. So if you have a given neutrino flux, no matter coming from where, say supernova, okay? know the cross-section for coherent inter interaction, you can calculate what is the recoil. So this gives the recoil energy. So differential recoil spectrum, how many recoil events you expect to see per unit time, per unit recoil energy is given simply by this formula. If you know this, this is a standard, you know this, all this you can calculate. And uh, these recoil energies are also known. And as I mentioned, it's neutron square. So you can calculate in a dark matter detector how many events you can expect from a supernova burst neutrino. So these are various astrophysical neutrino sources in the, so this is a supernova burst 1987A. So you see this is a high flux. So astrophysics universe naturally provides for you such high flux of neutrinos that you can utilize to detect uh, the, uh, uh, yeah, unfortunately the energy is too small. But so the cross section roughly goes as the square of the neutrino energy normal. So it you, you have beaten all the flux is high, cross section is too low. So this one in dark matter detector, you can actually can you or can you not detect? So that's what we investigate. Now the problem, this is a problem because solar neutrinos, as I showed, there are many kinds of neutrinos, sun emits neutrinos, atmosphere, our cosmic ray produces neutrinos in our atmosphere. All these things interact. Will, it will be interacting in your detector. And these dark matter detectors have a problem because these neutrinos coherently interact and can exactly mimic the spectrum, recoil spectrum seen by uh, expected from a dark matter interaction. So it is becoming very difficult now because, so for example, a 6 GeV WIMP, 6 GeV mass WIMP, okay, will have a recoil spectrum in a dark matter detector, same as a beryllium, uh, sorry, the boron-8 neutrinos coming from the sun. So exactly this shape. So they will overlap with each other. You can't tell, even if you got a click in your detector, dark matter detector, ostensibly from your dark matter particles, but it could be coming from sun, how can you exclude? So similarly, atmospheric neutrinos will be mimicking a dark matter signal at 100 GeV. So this is a problem for dark matter detectors and gives rise to what is called neutrino flow. That is, 
your dark matter detector, if it becomes too sensitive, so that it now can start detecting the neutrinos by coherent interaction, then you are done because you can't detect the dark matter particles any further. So this is called hitting the neutrino floor and the present detectors are almost coming very close to the neutrino floor. So unless your detectors have directional sensitivity, dark matter detectors, so that if it is coming from solar neutrino, you can exclude this because if your event is coming from a direction other than that of the sun, then you can say, huh, that can be due to dark matter, not solar neutrino. So, but currently directional sensitive dark matter detectors are not many and very preliminary stage. So this is a problem for normal steady sources of neutrinos like solar neutrino, atmospheric neutrino. But a good advantage for a burst neutrino like supernova, if a supernova neutrino suddenly goes, you know, burst, then what happens is this floor neutrino actually comes up here, becomes the ceiling. And so you start detecting, it will respond to that immediately within that 10 seconds period of neutrinos and hardly any uh, uh, background because you can use the timing signal during that 10 seconds period and exclude many of the other. So it's a, it should be a very clean signal. So supernova neutrinos in liquid xenon based dark matters. So knowing the supernova flux spectrum, which we know, okay, knowing the recoil spectrum, which we can calculate from knowing the flux and the cross section for uh, uh, this coherent uh, elastic neutrino nuclear scattering. Okay, and there is also additional inelastic charge current, which I'll mention. So uh, you can uh, detect this. Now, following slides, I'll avoid the details of the calculations. It's there in a recent paper that I'll mention later. So what I'll do, so this is the flux spectrum of neutrinos. This is, uh, as I already showed, knowing all this thing, you can employ the flavor oscillation of neutrinos, some uh, details. So this, is the recoil spectrum, okay, that is counts, recoil counts, okay, per ton of your detector material, okay, per kilo electron volt of recoil energy, differential spectrum due to coherent interaction goes like this. And this is another process called neutrino induced neutrons, okay, which goes like this. So your aim is to detect this, okay, and this is a very, uh, another uh, process is that there can be also excitation, charge current process. This nucleus can be excited. It becomes a cesium, then on nucleus becomes a cesium. Okay, it is excited. It de-excites by emitting neutrons and gammas, which also you can detect. So I'll again, uh, uh, cross sections are known and skip the details. So this is the total cross section for this charge current process. And this is the total neutron emission cross section. And this is the, uh, uh, total number of electrons emitted in the charge current process, spectrum of it. I'm just flashing this because you have to know how these are, uh, calculations of how these are obtained are very detailed. Nuclear physics and other things involved, not of much uh, use here. Uh, and the number of neutrons that are emitted per neutron energy, number of gammas. So I have everything with me, number of uh, the recoil spectrum, number of neutrons emitted, number of gammas emitted, number of electrons emitted. And then I go back to a detector. You can do a detailed simulation, okay, uh, uh, in a, uh, of these objects in a giant simulation. Uh, by the way, this was the main guy who did it is Sion Ghosh, uh, one of uh, SINP students, who is now a postdoc at Purdue. So uh, uh, this was all done. And uh, I, I'll avoid the details. I'll just show you the final uh, results. So these are the number of uh, uh, events that you expect from these processes. Right, you can scale it to any, because it goes like the square of the distance. So we just calculated for one KPC. So numbers can be calculated for 10 KPC by dividing by a factor of 100. Right, so you can make up for, for this is one ton. So next generation detectors will be 40 tons, like Darwin. So it's an interplay of the tonnage and the distance. So these are various, these so-called S1 light signal and S2 light signal, again, very technically uh, details, but just to 
show you that you can do these calculations and uh, various if i'll how much time is left since not much time let me first yeah let me summarize uh, the uh, things in qualitative details and the quantitative details if there are questions i can answer the future very large multi 10 ton class so 40 ton class for example liquid xenon detectors for dark matter searches will be sensitive to supernova neutrino induced xenon nuclear recoils due to the coherent elastic neutrino nucleus process okay which involves neutral current interaction with all the six species of neutrinos including their entry neutrinos so very important because it can give us an estimate of the how much total energy is emitted by the supernova. Uh, we have pointed out that in addition to this, the, these detectors will also be sensitive to mean elastic charge current interactions in the same detector. So you have all flavor detection and separately new E detection only in the same detector also is possible. So the ratio of the two will give you a distribution of the energy in various flavors. So that's what was the goal of this. Uh, so, uh, so these are various uh, actual numbers that you see. So I'll go to this uh, last line. Detection and identification of charge current events due to mu E charge current interactions together with coherent interactions in a dark matter detector in the next generation, okay, may provide a group good probe for very useful information about the distribution of the total supernova explosion energy going into different uh, neutrino flavor. Since the time is short, so here is the, some uh, reference to the technical details. Here are some of my collaborators who have worked with me on this. And, uh, but, uh, uh, so, so this is basically uh, the end of the talk. Thank you. I hope I've finished in time. And okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, okay. So, time for questions from the audience. Questions, Devanja? Yeah, you can ask any question. Yes. Could be some admixture. Oh, there they didn't have direction. So, so they have to depend on others or because this by excess and since. Yes, it coincides with the. Yes, yes. And IMB also independently uh, about the same time. And, and one more thing, said, this, this technique mm -hmm. is sensitive for all. Right. But we know that uh, this only electronic will be Right. And other flavors will be after one will be uh, the actual phase or the other. Right. 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 Yes. Okay, on the desk. Okay. Yes, uh, this is the you. question. Ah, right. Is there a way to uh, like separate like uh, the nuclear part and the nuclear Yes, that's a very interesting question. Uh, in 2014, actually, with Shobhan Chakraborty and Kamalesh Da, Kamalesh Kaur, we wrote a paper where you can actually demarcate you, this dark matter.